Let's break it. Well, it's good to have everybody back for another episode of our breaking radio and fixing radio and breaking and fixing, etc., etc. I'm glad you all are here to hang in there with me. Now, one thing I plan to do throughout this entire series, and I stated in the beginning, I did not know how long this series would continue, how many videos it would take. I, if I remember correctly, I said it will take as many videos as it takes. And that's what we're going to do. So if you're bored easily, eh, go find a video about some rock star who broke his fingernail. Those guys usually get a million and a half hits, you know. <laughs> Let's go back and review a little bit of what we've already done. I'm not going to go crazy on it. <clears throat> we have our voltage you know, coming in uh, right here, running up through the uh, filament. And then up through to the plate. Out comes the, this is, gives us our plate voltage. It comes out, it runs through a couple of caps and through this resistor. Incidentally, I failed to mention on that resistor, not only is that, you know, that resistor functions as a cheap choke. A cheap choke. You know, normally they run, uh, in the old radios, they would run the uh, voltage coming out of the rectifier through the coil, the field coil on the speaker. That would help smooth it down because, you know, an inductor opposes AC voltage and you know what we got coming out of here is you know pulsating DC which is changing voltage which is similar to AC it goes up and down up and down <clears throat> and, and you know so they always use that coil on the back of the speaker the field coil but this doesn't have it it's got a permanent magnet speaker so what they did was to put, they just put a resistor between these two uh, electrolytic capacitors and that cut down amplitude which sort of acted as a choke okay it does not oppose AC uh, sine wave style type up down voltage but it does cut down amplitude so it functions as a choke so to speak cheap choke okay chokes are very expensive they're very large they took up a lot of room they were pretty heavy what they could do the whole thing they felt <clears throat> on these new AA5 radios with just a resistor now here's something I want to read to you about AA5 radios that Brendan sent to me and I, I thought and for those of you who don't know who Brendan is again he's my electronics mentor lives up in Detroit in the Detroit area <clears throat> I'm gonna read something here that he wrote and I was kind of uh, impressed by it so while I'm reading it I want you to kind of pay attention and gander at the schematic he wrote simple as these sets are they are actually a marvel of engineering you should make this point with your viewers, which I'm now doing. There isn't a component in them that isn't needed or doesn't serve a purpose, or sometimes multiple purposes. They are the culmination of all that was learned about radio in the years before them. Yet, they can be assembled cheaply in a hundred different ways, parts layout, etc., and they still work just fine. If ever there was a modern marvel, it is the All-American 5 radio. I thought that was cool. That was very well written, made perfect sense to me, and it should make perfect sense to you, okay? All right, we got our power supply all going with the voltages going out, and then, of course, we went over here on the next video. Let me zoom in on this mess. If I can get a little bit of focus here. Come on, there we go. All right, we got our, you know, we got our resonate, our, our, our tank here, tank circuit, uh, inductive capacitive tank circuit, <clears throat> or RC, and that, a lot of people call them RC tank circuits, and that's it. This one happens to be an LC tank circuit. Signal comes in and mixes in here with the signal that cut with the uh, frequency that comes out of the oscillator, local oscillator, uh, which is 455 kilocycles above the frequency that comes in here. They mix together and we get 455 out, which goes into the uh, primary coil of the intermediate frequency transformer or the IF transformer. Now, we went ahead and shorted a couple of things. We shorted this, we opened this, but we really haven't done a whole lot over here. And Brendan said, you know, John, what you should have done instead of just telling everybody that this uh, control grid right here has po negative 0.3 volts. Now that negative 0.3 volts, you know, is coming out of this, this entire circuit right here, this whole circuit from here when the tube begins to conduct, <clears throat> current it comes up, goes through this coil, goes up. This is the primary of the oscillator coil. It comes up, builds up a field, cuts across here, generate, and it's tuned with the uh, tuner, the plates on the tuner. 
this little jewel right here is a trimmer capacitor and you up here we have another trimmer capacitor why do we need these trimmer capacitors well this is a mechanical operation guys mechanical okay you know the aluminum plates that mess with mesh with one another they do get loose they do get loose they wobble a little bit over time and they're not exactly accurate like our little digital jobbies we had today so the way we could compensate for any mechanical sloppiness or whatever you know in the mechanical functions of these sets of plates we can you know overcome it so this would be coarse and fine coarse adjust fine adjust on this capacitor same up here coarse and fine okay i'm going to go ahead and measure the control grid voltage on this schematic it says it's supposed to be negative 0.3 volts coming out of you know our local oscillator well, let's go ahead let me see i'm going to measure on pin one uh, which is the tube side of r2 or the tube side of r3 it doesn't matter this is the one we shorted and opened last time remember we'll go over to this side now let me go ahead and take a voltage reading right there see what we get all right it's down in here <clears throat> let me find where my there it is right there right there is r3 the junction of r3 and R2 is over there underneath that uh, yellow wire. See it down in there? So I think what I'm going to do is easier to get to right here. <clears throat> Let me go ahead and zoom even closer. I'll just go ahead and touch it right there. This is the tube side, and we should get negative 0.3 volts on the control grid. So let's go ahead and touch it, see what we get. My goodness, that's a long way down through this camera. <laughs> that doesn't look that far. All right, there we go, because I've got the radio on. Now what have I got here? Oop, might be touching the wrong thing. Let me get a hold of the right thing. There we go. We're supposed to have negative 0.3. We have negative 6.36. <clears throat> what's the deal on that? All right, here's what's going on, folks. There is nothing wrong with negative 6.3 volts. <clears throat> the way Brendan explained it to me is if you go over negative 10 volts, then you might have a problem. Or if the control grid right here goes positive, you might have a problem. So anything up to about, oh, negative 10 volts DC would be acceptable right here. I happen to have 6.36. It's very good. It's coming out of this mess right down here, okay? You know, now in a new person or myself, when I first started, I would have looked at that and said, oh my God, look at all the voltage I got in that control grid. What is going on here? I don't I don't want that much voltage there must be something wrong well there's nothing wrong okay that's just kind of a ballpark figure they put on there I wish they wouldn't even put it on there because that you know for a new person like myself or maybe you that would be very misleading all right I hope everybody kind of got that as long as it's not over negative 10 then you start getting into real problems if you do that and as long as it's not positive you don't want a positive voltage there if you're doing troubleshooting, okay? Then you'll be good to go. All right. Now, the next thing we're going to do is I think I'll go ahead and short across R2. We'll, we'll turn on the radio. Now, of course, if I opened any of these, you know what would happen. We'd lose our control grid voltage, and nothing would work inside the tube. There'd be no frequency mixing. There would be no 455 kilocycles out. So there's no need to open these up. <clears throat> However, I can short across... R2 and see what happens with that. So let's set that up and get that moving here. All right, here we go. We're going to go ahead and short across R2. I've got one lead hooked up on the back back here. Let's turn up the volume, get a little station going here. I'm not winded when I walk from the parking garage to the building. Now I'll take this one, I'll short right across it. Right between those two. Sure, you back up here a little bit. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think I'm going to get a squeal? Do you think I'm going to get a click or a shudder or anything like that? Let's find out. Come on in and see what's cooking today. I don't even start cooking till you order. So Radio goes dead. <laughs> there it is. Radio is dead. All right. Again, we have the situation where we have a dead radio. All right. Incidentally, incidentally. The last video, I believe it was, I told you if you, you know, you turn on your radio and it's dead, 
you might want to start looking over here in, in this tube area in this oscillator section right here. Well, you know, there's another place you might want to consider looking. I don't, I don't know why I didn't mention it. Here's another place. See this filament string on these tubes? One of the, one of the uh, heater strings, uh, one of the heaters rather, in the string could be burned out. One of the tube heaters could be burned out. I just had that same problem in a silver tone I just repaired. I had a uh, 12 AV6, what was, which was the first filament, or the first heater off the switch. And nothing worked. I made mean, the radio stone dead. Turned out to be the filament was uh, open. So I had to change the tube. The next thing we're going to try to do is short across this capacitor right here. If I open it, like I said, either R2 or C3, it's going to cut the signal out to the tube. Everything's going to go dead. And we already know that shorting across R2 makes everything go dead. So let's find out what happens if we short across C3 which is a coupling capacitor. This is the coupling capacitor. This resistor is used as an impedance matching uh, setup for the control grid in the tube. So let's, let's short across the coupling capacitor and see what happens. All right, let's turn up the volume. I'm serious, let me tell you what I'm talking All right, about. there's the station. Let's when hook up our first I'm one. not talking about. Yeah, see, we lost our station already. Lost our station already. What happens if I touch it? Let's touch it across anyway and see what happens. Dead. Goes dead. All right, all right. <laughs> well, that one kills the radio also. So there we go, guys. We've covered everything in this area that we can possibly cover. Uh, let me see. Well, no, we didn't short across the trimmer cap. What happens if I shorted across the trimmer cap? No, I don't want to open it up because it would require me to take out the mica, the mica insulator that's between the two. But, you know, we might be able to short across it. Let's see what that does. I have no idea what's going to happen. Let me get that set up. Let's take a look at this uh, trimmer cap here. It is right here. It consists of a screw on one side connected to one set of plates. The screw goes down against that set of plate. That plate closes when you screw the screw in. The bottom side connects to this tab right here. So when you screw, you know, when you adjust the uh, the trimmer cap, this top plate goes down or up against a piece of mica. Mica is a mineral. It's a very thin piece of mica, mica, M-I-C-A, and it can, it, you know, it adjusts the capacitance between the top plate and the bottom plate. So let's go ahead and hook to one side here. Let me get it hooked up. There we are. We're hooked to one side now. Now all we got to do is take the other lead and touch the top of the screw because the top of the screw is against the other plate. So let's go ahead and turn up the volume. By the way, what do you think is going to happen this time? You think that little trimmer cap right there, you think that's going to be able to, you know, stop the whole radio, just kill the whole radio? Let's find out. Let me turn up the volume. Ah, here we go. Killed it dead. Killed it dead. All right, shorting that trimmer cap, what you're essentially doing is shorting it up. You know, you got, a, you got a lead here, and you got a lead here, and you've jumped across here. You're keeping this tank from resonating. It can't resonate anymore because you have essentially, well, actually, what you've done is you've jumped these two plates as well. See, these are in parallel. And the signal, the, if it doesn't resonate, you don't get a signal in to here uh, to mix with what's coming out of the local oscillator, okay? That's what's happening here. Last but not least on this uh, section of the radio is right here, that capacitor right there. That capacitor provides the RF return path to ground. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean the RF comes in, causes the tank to resonate, comes on down, goes to that cap to ground. Now it returns to its source. You all know that in order for a circuit to work properly, it has to have uh, you know, a supply and a return. It has to be, you know, there has to be a complete circuit. Well, the same thing applies for RF or radio frequency or 
the carrier frequency uh, that we have coming from the radio station. It comes in here, gets the old tank oscillating, and continues on down. I mean, keep in mind, it's, keeping, it's constantly coming in. As long as you're tuned to that station, it's constantly coming in. And it has to go back. It goes back through that cap to ground, on back to the station, or back, back to where the source was, okay? So what we're going to do, now this capacitor provides another function that has to do with the uh, automatic volume control. We'll go over that later. Remember what Brendan says, some of these uh, components in here have more than one uh, function. That's what made this radio so efficient. So what we're going to do, just to see what happens, I want to disconnect that capacitor. That capacitor is, what is that thing, that's C2. It's a .047. We're going to disconnect the ground side. Now this is the, this is the capacitor, this yellow one right here. Let me back up here a little bit. And the ground side is right here. We're going to go ahead and unsolder that and lift it up. Then I'm going to, you know, gator wire it in, get the radio playing, then disconnect it, uh, you know, connect it, disconnect it, dis and connect it, and just kind of give us an idea. I have no idea what's going to happen. We may get squealing. We may get the radio to quit. I don't know. Let's find out together. All right, I've got the uh, one end of the capacitor lifted up out of the circuit board. I got it hooked with a gator wire. And then I've got the other end of the gator wire clipped down to the bottom here in the same line where the capacitor was originally soldered. Now let's turn up the volume. Well, we're not getting much on that. Let's see if we can find a better station there. There we go. Alright, we'll use that station right there. Now let's go ahead and disconnect the uh, capacitor that provides the return path for the radio frequency or the carrier. <laughs> that didn't sound very good. That was louder than I thought. Let's try that again. I don't know why. I guess it was just up real loud. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Check this out. Ooh, hoo, hoo. You know, you know, when you hear that bird chirping, usually it's in the, in the front end of the radio. Check that out, okay? All right, let me hook it back up here. All right, one more time. That was too cool. That was too cool to just let go once. Let's, let's do it again. Now, you know, I've had a lot of radios that did that. I've had a lot of radios that did that, and I wound up, you know, replacing all the capacitors, and it disappeared. It was probably because... One of these capacitors like this that was connected to ground in the front end of the radio was shorted or open or whatever, okay? Cool stuff. All right, I think what we're gonna do is go ahead and wrap this video up here. I hope you learned something. I hope you all are having a little bit of fun. I'm learning, you know, every time I turn around, I'm uh, bugging poor old Brendan about something. I feel bad for him. He'll say, <laughs> he'll say, well, wait a minute, I told you about this a while back. You know, right, right. You told me about a lot of things. <laughs> I can't remember, you know, but maybe 25% of them. I, but I'll tell you what, going through this radio piece by piece, section by section, item by item with all you viewers, man, I'll tell you what, we're all learning, aren't we? There might be one more thing I have to cover. Let me find out. Oh, yeah. The last thing I wanted to cover goes back to C2 here. You remember over here in the power supply from the first, I think it was the first video we did in this series. Remember C5 right here uh, allows high frequency spikes to pass through the ground but it does not allow the 60 cycles and the whole thing was based on the capacitive reactants how if the frequency goes up the reactants goes down and it allows the high frequency to pass through the ground. Remember that? Well the same thing applies to this capacitor right here. We're dealing with thousands of cycles of radio frequency. And once it comes in, it gets the tank oscillating. Again, it's a high frequency. You know, this, this, this particular uh, capacitor was chosen to allow those high frequencies to go on through the ground. And that's how they're able to establish the RF return path to ground because the RF at that high frequency or the carrier frequency is what we're talking about here, the carrier frequency goes through that capacitor to ground as if the capacitor was not even there.
That knob was missing from the radio when I bought it. And I went on Antique Radio Forum, and all I could come up with was a fellow offered me a brown one. You know, that's, that's not what I wanted. I wanted a white one. I showed a picture of it and everything. I looked around, looked around, looked around. I looked everywhere and was unable to come up with one. But then I contacted uh, our good friend, Radio TV Phono Nut, Brian. And I said, Brian, you know, you've got a couple of these radios. Would you happen to have any knobs that, from previous radios like this? You know, he's got tons of stuff, I guess. I said, if you have one of those knobs right there, I'd kind of like to buy it. It's the on-off knob, and I don't, I don't have one. The only thing sticking out is that little metal shaft. He said, let me look around and get back with you. Well, a few days later, he got back with me. He said, yes, I do have it, and I'll send it to you. And he sent it to me and didn't charge me a penny. So now our radio is complete, right down to the missing knob. So, you know, old, old radio TV phono nuts been kind of down in the dumps here lately. I've been detecting that on his uh, videos that he's been posting. So, you know, we need to cheer the boy up. So he got me that knob right there. Well, we all know what that means, don't we? Shout out to radio TV phono nut.